So my name is Marc Leobet. I'm French, French of contact, and I'm so curious to see you, so, so, so many, to hear things about uh, what is uh, a Roman Empire allows, you know. Uh, so please, who knows OpenStreetMap? Good. Who knows what is a common good? Hey, thank you. Uh, who has any issue with licenses? And so, uh, the, 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 the way we are thinking on uh, at the French government level is how to solve things between the eruption of uh, OpenStreetMap as a, uh, a key producer for, of, uh, of data and how we manage it with sovereign data, that is sovereignty of my country, and with GIFA, open data, blah, blah, blah. And so, to, to begin with, uh, common good, a common good is this, that. That is, a Saharan oasis. In Saharan oasis, the water is crucial. A common good is I don't know what, because there is no definition of what is a common good. There is different philosophical way to explain what it is, but when you are in a government, it is not sufficient. So what we said in my government is a common good is something, I read the official definition in my government, a common good is what is shared and beneficial for all. That is, if I use it, you can use two and it is free for all. That is the definition we have, uh, we have kept now. And so it is ideal, but the world is greedy. And so to manage a common good, we have rules, we have governance, and we have sanctions. That is, in this oasis, the rules is you have water, sufficiently for your field. If you have a big field, you have more water than if you have a little field. The government, it is a council, usually a, 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 a council of elder, decide what you need for your field. And there is sanction. If you steal water, the penalty was death. Normal. And so, it is uh, the, the the big picture of what could be a common good. Penalty of death is not applied in France now. What is a sovereign data? A sovereign data, uh, we, um, the Parliament, uh, a member of Parliament made a, a report this year uh, asking by the Prime Minister. And it is something directly used for public decision. That is, the sovereign data has made to support the rule of law. It is not little thing. And so I made so, some, uh, some explanation, fluid, on, uh, of course, defense, and so on. And indirectly, the description of geography is a sovereign data, because we need it to know where facts, fluid, or uh, urban planning are taking place. And so it is more or less the Annex 1 on Inspired Directive, of course, because I think the college letters followed the same, the same mind to, to organize it. We have two consequences. First, we have to be independent to a third party because it is sovereignty, you know. So we can't depend on a GAFA or a Google, but we can't defend, depend on OpenStreetMap too. And if one day we will have to depend on uh, an official an European mapping uh, agency, we will have many things to, uh, to define for that. The second point is, because it is public decision applying to society and citizen, we have to be able to understand what could be the impact. That is, we have to master the data qualification. If the data is not accurate, we have to know to be more soft, maybe, on the, on the laws taken by the, uh, the French parliament, sorry. And we have decided, because all of that, that there is only one possible license for it. It is an open license, because 
We are talking about government, we are talking about rule of law, so anybody has to be able to do what he wants, that is a free reuse of sovereign data, to be able to understand, to redo, or to do what he wants, to understand, to control also uh, the, the government, local or national. So only one open license. And so the world is not simple, as you know. I to I've talked about sovereign data, but we have authoritative data. I never understand really what it is because we have no definition of it, in, at least in my country. We have a national mapping agency creating reference data, of course. We have Eurogeographics. It's a club of, uh, of a national mapping agency. We have, I don't know in your country, but in my country, biodiversity is made by people, citizens, working in uh, free associations. And uh, after, after the street map, we have community, community sourcing. I don't know if this word is, uh, is shared every, everywhere. We have the drivers we have had this morning. Uh, but we have two emergency services in France. They are working together to, to throw to the National Mapping Agency what they found as an address, new routes, and so on for uh, emergency cases. Uh, private data of public interest, because we've decided in the French law uh, two years ago that when uh, you, you have to, to make a study about impact on the environment of a new plant or, and so on, it's a directive, uh, the information about the biodiversity funded as this support during that uh, job has to be shared because it is a, a public interest to share the data on biodiversity with everybody on, in France, that private data are now public opened data. And at last, global companies that are very nice, very efficient, but they are US. And so when we are talking about sovereignty, it is not absolutely neutral. And so what we are trying to do, working on these stories about common good and sovereignty, is to understand, to, to create a conceptual level, to be able to, to create rules, to understand how we can put that data in that field, blah, blah, blah. But if you, we think, as we are maybe French, uh, that we, if we not have enough conceptual keys to, to, to make the legal decision about laws, it is more difficult and we have to bargain anytime, anywhere with uh, French public authorities at least. So in our mind, we have two legs to work on that is inspire for data sharing, that is for metadata, but above all for web services and for harmonization. It, because we need to create machine-to-machine -machine services to be able, to, not only e-government, but to just to be more efficient for a citizen point of view. And of course, open data is a huge, uh, a huge movement for, for some years now. So now in France, it is open data by default for everybody, uh, public authorities. But at the same time, we have an issue with, uh, with GAFA, and we think that common goods could be seen as a solution. That's the reason why I began by common goods. And so digital common goods, so I have two minutes, sorry. So first, a share-like license to protect the common goods. ODBL or Creative Common, we have a preference for ODBL, but the idea is a share-like license. Governance by the community, by the people, because it's, it is obviously complicated. This governance has to be public and transparent. That's the reason why OpenStreetMap is not a common good, because they probably have a governance, but it is not public nor transparent. So we have a gap with that. A sanction, because if you choose a license, please defend it or drop it. I never heard, I, I wrote it, uh, a, a trial because a share-like license was not respected. And so we push public complication to users with very difficult to understand license. ODBL is not so easy to, to understand. But if you don't go to the end of the idea to have a share-like license, choose an open license. And so the conclusion is 
we are not against one or one other of the actor I said before, because we are really, it's a, no, a political point of view, that we need the big and we need the little, because the little are more agile and we are big and not agile at all. And uh, f furthermore, citizens are on the two sides, they, they are under the rule of law, but at the same time, more and more they are in the communities and they are active. And so, we have to respect them, and we have, it's again a French law, we have to let them understand how we decide on what algorithms are in place in e-government. Not only the data, but the way we manage the data to take public decision. And so, I made sovereign data uh, is not against common good uh, because it is written, but in fact, we are working to, we are we are working, we are thinking to be able to push the sovereign data to open street maps, to be clear. Because we think today it is the European interoperable data set. Thank you. So you have understood something, at least. I'm, I'm going to ask a question that I wanted to ask at the plenary, but then couldn't. Um, in the plenary, there was discussion on whether you can use uh, public data to barter a deal with private companies to give for them to give you their private data for the common good. Um, so I was actually wondering, is, is that actually saying that we should not have open data anymore because we can use the data that we have in the public uh, administrations to, to strike a deal with private companies to get to their data? Provocative question. Oh, I think we, it is a misunderstanding because in, uh, the, the law uh, to, to get the private data from companies to, to the public data uh, is uh, two years ago. So, uh, in, France, uh, in France, of course, I, you know, I'm a France representative. <laughs> I don't know if there is country outside. <laughs> Linda Carton from the Netherlands. Do you want to impose any restrictions on people and companies harvesting data in the public space, like uh, smart cars, uh, people with phones, sensors hanging up in your garden, measuring everything around? Do you want to govern that? So, we, we don't govern because, uh, first, I think it, we can't, but we decided to use uh, legacy, that is the licenses, Open license, that is, we don't care about who we use for what. It's clear. ODBL, in fact, is a more tricky way to, to control because usually big society are reluctant to do things they don't understand on a legal point of view. That is, ODBL was made by OpenStreetMap to protect OpenStreetMap from Google. Because it has, I, I believe, very few people understand what is really in an ODBL license, they don't touch it. It is radioactive, you know. And so, uh, ODBL don't, doesn't prevent any reuse, but if you do something, you have to share. But, uh, so if it is a little society, we don't care, if it's either a CME or something like that. If at one moment a huge European or global society or Chinese China society decide to take the data and don't get the data back, following Mrs. Thatcher, uh, of course, I think, we think, that we will have to prosecute it. So it's a fair announcement about a fair license. It is a legal framework. And so, again, uh, the more the, the, the data paid by the taxpayer will be used, the, the more we will be happy. But we need the rules. The governance is a crucial point. Okay, so um, I would say it's not my first presentation about the Federal Geo Platform for the Inspire conference, but it always gives me the opportunity to promote the approach 
taken by one of our federal partners regarding the INSPIRE implementation. And this year, uh, I, we will present the approaches taken by, the, by IRSALIN, the Interregional Agency for Environment. So I will structure my presentation in such a way. I will briefly introduce the Federal Geo Platform, uh, show, uh, presenting the partnership and the collaboration uh, that we have set up between the federal stakeholders, which is for me a key factor of success uh, for achieving this inspired implementation. After that, the status of the INSPIRE implementation at Irsaline, describing a specific points, which is how INSPIRE requirements on interoperability have been adopted and integrated into their data process workflow. And of course, that I will allow some, uh, some finding and conclusion about this analysis. Okay, so, so I would say that uh, the Federal Geo Platform gave access to metadata, data, and web service from seven federal bodies and Isolin. All in all, the available data set cover 29 teams on the 34 ones. So it means that Annex 3 takes a significant part for delivering information on sea region, atmospheric meteorological conditions, air quality and species distribution. So these data sets belongs to specific environmental domain and link with real-time assessments, metadata, dynamic data related to scientific information, where finally spatial data set is a minor component. So those partners are not developed skills and expertise for handling special data as such. And it's why NGS has taken a geo broker role, including the provision of technical expertise, uh, training and technical workshop. And we also develop our own specific federal uh, guidelines and recommendation for validation and quality control. And with the possibility also to hold some web services if they found it's not really their, uh, their expertise to do so. We are also the, uh, responsible for, for the provision of the federal discovery service and for the reporting and monitoring. So, as a result, we have provided a geocatalog, which includes, of course, Inspire data, but not only uh, uh, Inspire, we also provide authoritative, authoritative data sets. So, we have also implemented a map viewer, which allowed the visualization of the data set based on the available web services. So, so far, we have achieved the Inspire compliance of data set and next one, which are uh, downloadable to WFS and Atom feed with the statistical units as well. So let me introduce no Irsaline. In Belgium, in fact, uh, the environmental policies is uh, under the responsibility of the region, the three region, the Flemish one, Brussels one, and Wallon one. However, for the specific domain of air quality assessment, and reporting, the regions have agreed to strengthen their cooperation with the creation of the Interregional Environmental Agency, whose main function is to act as the national point of contact for IONET and provide air quality measurement in different access, so continuous forecast, air quality information in real time, making the report to IONET and also uh, uh, integrating the data from, from the region for covering the national uh, coverage. So far, what are the status of uh, the INSPIRE uh, implementation? I would say that um, Eusolin has identified two special data sets classified into the INSPIRE team. We have the air quality assessment zone, which are issued for reporting units. We have also the air quality maps, which are classified in the atmospheric conditions. 
They have provided Inspire metadata. The data are viewable and downloadable to WMS, WFS, and they are also accessible in GML. You see that I don't speak about any Inspire compliancy, and that's not the case. They made the data accessible, visualable, with GML and that, but it's not yet Inspire compliant. They have also recently uh, documented uh, the data set from the Water Framework Directive, providing may inspire metadata compliant. And uh, this has been identified with a single metadata. They are effectively water framework directive data set are effectively maintained at regional level, but in, decide to have three copies of the same content. We decide to have one metadata with a single content, but with three different authors. Oh, it's a part of, of, the, of the game. There, of course, there is no yet, not yet any view service or download service, but the data are available on the, on the IONET side. So what is the collaboration we have uh, decided with Iselin? But Well, Iselin is in fact working in a very autonomous way. It's providing its own discovery service, data and web service, which are published on the federal platform. So besides inspired compliance of metadata, Ursulin currently has not the aim to provide any inspired data set so far or compliant web services. So it is so it has opened the discussion why they will not go a little bit further regarding this inspired interoperability and requirements. And, uh, well, I try to also be the ambassador of, I would say, this feeling of unease that some of the environment stakeholders has regarding the interoperability requirements of INSPI. And yesterday, I, we went, okay, we went uh, at, the, uh, at a workshop uh, speaking about uh, INSPIRE, what are the main barriers so that we can still speed up uh, the, the progress of the board INSPIRE. And you see, uh, I put a, <laughs> a picture of the, of the panel. You see all the anchors that slowed on the progress of INSPIRE. What was interesting is that the representative were coming from, from uh, agriculture and from maritime. So, it comforted me in the fact that the sh they share the same views and opinion than Iserin. And what's, what are these, finally, their own analysis on the acceptance of INSPIRE interoperability? Principles are good. Legal framework so that allows to make the data visible, accessible, downloadable to web service. That's quite OK. Thank you for, for, for the setup of this network architecture that allow all these. That seems that there are some reluctances in the uh, inspired technical implementation as such, looking to focusing on pure interoperability. And probably that there are a lot of frustration also, and this is the main, main aspect is regarding data specifications. This is really com complicated and probably not, not fit for their purpose. They don't see any user for the data they would provide inspired compliant. The web services are not adopted, uh, also adapted to their needs, and it is also a problem. Uh, they use uh, all they use uh, SOS REST API for for real time assessment, and they wonder about all these additional constraints and additional burden to be inspired compliant. Um, so this is. Uh, I would say the statement. So we, we try to find out what might be the, 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 the solution and, or uh, what, how we can improve so that inspire interoperability and in requirement can be better accepted by a specific environmental domain deal, dealing with dynamic data, real-time assessment. And probably that inspire should a little bit open its standard to, to fit better to these specific domains um, and should evolve. We, of course, speak about simplicity, fit for purpose. And I remember you, Hugo, that you were speaking about the problem of this complexity and simplicity. With the, where is the cursor? And it seems that now, between complexity uh, of inspire reaching interoperability and a better simplicity that fit for purpose, it seems that this is the kind of cursor that would 
the, that would satisfy such uh, specific stakeholder. Uh, so looking to alternative, order encoding, uh, focusing on the efficiency of data transmission. Uh, well, looking maybe to other data schema as well, uh, allowing other data schema, uh, using, for example, uh, uh, inspire as a vocabulary or a feature catalog. So, uh, uh, well, this is all this open track we could investigate in futures. So I will stop my, my presentation and I, res I would say I, re I stay really optimistic because Thanks to Inspire that allow this, that set a bridge between the environmental community and the Inspire community. But I think that now we have to discuss, to understand better each other, and to move steps towards each other. Thank you so much. Yeah, if I, thank you, Natalie. If I understood you correctly, and I witnessed recently a very good and focused data provision from Belgium uh, under this priority data set, activities, so you have really got the act together over the regions. But you said some of the data you're not providing as download service, and Ursuline would never do that. And I don't quite understand that, because this is not related to these technical questions, which you rightly raising, but which also I think the technical inspire people are addressing. So the variation in formats, the flexibility there. But didn't I hear you saying early on that some data you will not make available for download? Why is that? <coughs> Uh, well, actually, um, I'm not in, in, in the head of research. I, I cannot really answer to, to, to your questions. But actually, that's not clear uh, how this priority data set will be maintained uh, as it is, uh, in fact, the three regions which are responsible for those data. So, so far, I think that Esseline has made the urgency to document the data, the metadata are there, but I suspect that discussion is going on how they will provide the data through download service and view services. Thank you, Nathalie. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Irseline, uh, working at federal level, great services, great implementation. Now, you're also the national coordinator in, in, in Belgium with the NGI. Inspire. In fact, uh, we act as a federal, co yeah, <laughs> I would say federal coordinator. So um, we have uh, Irseline so as uh, participating to uh, our federal platform. Ah, the, the, my question relates to the agencies in the regions which are managing environmental data, like the Flemish Environment Agency. There is an agency in the Walloon region for the, the marine environment, for example. How do you work with these agencies to make sure that their environmental data also is available through the services? Or is that the wrong question to you? I, 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 in fact, we are not dealing with, uh, with the, uh, the... We are not responsible at federal level for the inspired implementations. And in fact, environment policy is really under the responsibility of the region. So there is a, a, a law, a regional law for, for, for the three region and for the federal. And we are acting at the same level of responsibility. So federal level is really uh, targeting the inspire implementation for all the federal agencies. And we have, in a way, welcome Irsaline because it's covering nationally the territory. And we have also... Uh, uh, the all the, at regional level, this con this the coordination, uh, inspire environment, but which is also stated at regional level. So when we have finally four partners, and there are uh, four Belgian four uh, different uh, catalogs and discovery services. It's why so it's really related to political structure. As mentioned, my name is Alexandre Fonseca. I am from uh, DGT, Portugal. And uh, the aim of this presentation is to, uh, to talk about the Cross Nature project and how this project, uh, how we expect that this project contribute to uh, enhance the development of uh, the national spatial data infrastructure and uh, the implementation of INSPIRE in Portugal. Um, 
so uh, DGT uh, has a different uh, is a publication agency responsible for different domains at the national level, which are here indicated, and uh, uh, related either to the land use planning or to the geographic information domains and uh, also develops research and development activities with projects and initiatives that are supported by European and uh, uh, European and national uh, funding uh, programs. Uh, but one of the, the missions that I would like to highlight uh, in relation, in the context of uh, this project presentation, are the, the coordination of the national spatial data infrastructure and the implementation of INSPIRE, as DGT is the national focal point for INSPIRE. Uh, accordingly, um, so we refer here the National Spatial Data Infrastructure, SNIG, which allows uh, through the GeoPortal to search, visualize and explore the spatial information at the national and the other levels produced by the official and private authorities. Presently, SNIG is under a uh, renovation uh, process and my colleague Daniel Furtado will talk about that uh, later on in this session uh, in his presentation. Uh, so, uh, cross-nature project. As I mentioned, uh, DGT has this uh, research and development uh, profile and uh, parallelly with the uh, activities that are related with the uh, implementation of the NSDI and the INSPIRE, we in, are involved in different uh, projects. And this is one project that we think can uh, have good results to make our uh, infrastructure go a little bit further. This project is uh, coordinated by Traxa Spain, is a cross-border project, uh, aims to uh, explore um, the cross harmonization of data from Spain and Portugal about nature and biodiversity and uh, using the linked open data approach. Uh, besides uh, DGT, uh, other partners are Universi Universidad Carlos III de Madrid, which is the technical partner, and uh, actually there should have been uh, taken place a presentation on the technical part of this project uh, two days ago here in the conference, but uh, uh, Javier Guzman could not come due to health issues. So unfortunately, we could not have that presentation. Uh, besides the, the consortium, we have also data providers either from Spain and Portugal. In Spain, the MAPAMA, Ministerio of Ambiente, Agricultura, Pesca y Alimentación. <laughs> and uh, our um, uh, nature and uh, nature conservation and forests uh, agency, which is ICNF. This is the uh, reference to the team in Portugal. We have different uh, people with different background and the core team that is more related with this project. Uh, so, cross-nature project goals are, uh, are indicated here. The project aims to develop a digital uh, services infrastructure using data sets on biodiversity and nature from the both countries and to adopt the linked open data approach to enrich and uh, uh, promote the access to the data in a more efficient way and uh, also to provide a better uh, service to the citizen. Uh, the project includes two different case studies, which I'm going to mention a little bit more further, uh, related either with the protected species in danger and also to the alien invasive species. These two case studies intend to, to uh, illustrate and test the approach. Uh, the linked open data approach here, I only present the 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 stair, the five star levels, uh, just to indicate that in Portuguese public administration, main uh, institutions are mainly in the third level where there's a lot of data available, but the data is not prepared to, be, to, to enter in this linked open data approach. So this project can represent an innovative approach in the Portuguese public administration. Uh, to mention the case studies, we have two case studies with different types of information and also with different uh, functionalities that are developed. Uh, the first case study uh, is um, 
uh, related, as I mentioned, with protected, the protected species data set and to encourage, encourage protection of species in danger. So the idea is to create an harmonized data model oriented towards the common publication of biodiversity presence and information on the ecosystems, as well as a mobile app based on the idea of the who's who game uh, that will allow the user to identify the endangered species. Here I have the, uh, identified the, the, the workflow for this case study from the data to the final uh, objective of the use case where we have the different phases, of course, to uh, transform the data and to create the ontologies and to create the RDFs. Uh, and finally, we will have a mobile app that will access to the data at the endpoint and uh, uh, allow to at access to the data that uh, is the objective of the case study. Uh, the other case study is related with alien invasive species and uh, it um, includes the data from ICNF and the EAs in uh, data that is provided by the member states for the uh, regulation on invasive species at the European level. And also we'll have uh, uh, data on the invasion risk map that is under development uh, uh, using GIS, of course, and uh, combining these data sets, we uh, have the data transformed and included in the endpoint to be accessed through a, a visualizer made using open layers. Uh, and this is one of other ideas. So in terms of uh, workflow of the project, uh, and according with the case studies I already referred, we have these different phases. Uh, and I would, uh, so we have to have the, the data from both countries harmonized in a coherent, coherent and interoperable way. So I would uh, just focus here on these two uh, phases, which are more related also with INSPIRE issues, and um, talk about a little bit about that. So the data we have is data from the Habitats and Birds Directive and also from EAs in uh, reporting uh, at the European level. So all the data is uh, um, uh, as inspire obligations. Um, and in this project, uh, we think this is an opportunity for us to uh, collaborate with the responsible entity for this data, which is ICNEF, and we are doing that at the moment. And we are supporting the harmonization of the data and also the capacitation of this in institution to spread this knowledge to the other, uh, um, the other uh, data that they have to harmonize. Uh, the, the issues that we had to deal in terms of harmonization of the data, for instance, here we have the habitat data set, uh, and uh, we have the original data in shapefile and access, so it's from the AEONET data. Uh, we have been uh, generating three, 23 map elements uh, from the Inspire application schema, and uh, we and whenever possible, we try to have all the elements using the HTTP URIs because that's very important to, for the linking the data and all the href reference elements had internal and external uh, resolution. Of course, also the species distribution elements had to uh, consider uh, multiplicity in the mapping process. Uh, the, the, the software that was used to create, uh, of course, we had to create an ontology, which is Plinian, to use an ontology with, which is Plinian Core. The data, our Inspire GML was transformed to uh, Inspire RDF, that is then um, uh, stored uh, in the, the project endpoint uh, using the Virtuoso uh, server. Uh, and uh, uh, to finalize, I would like to mention that this project is in line with, with several of uh, SNIG implementation uh, principles. We are using open source there, data, this, uh, data that is uh, accessible for free. Uh, we are creating the links using the URE, so we want to have more and more information, and these use cases will help us to show the interest and also to make other institutions to um, apply this kind of approach. 
and uh, of course the, the 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 idea of reusing the information and enriching the information that is available at the national spatial infrastructure. We have a cross-border integrated data. We allow to query the data us using the cross nature sparkle endpoint and the merging of the data we want to merge the data with other sparkle endpoints available and information produced by other uh, producers even uh, if uh, from crowdsourcing um, in terms of benefits for the NSDI and inspire implementation here we have identified not only the the harmonization of the data sets from species distribution also, we are producing a step-by-step -step guideline for the nature conservation entities to use this guideline. Uh, we have been uh, developing some uh, formation events, and so we are investing in SNE entities capacitation, and we are promoting data sharing and cross-border integrated data. Uh, in terms of collaborating with other entities, as I mentioned, we are trying to involve also in our case studies in, in the area of nature and biodiversity information, other initiatives in Portugal and also in Spain, such as Flora One and uh, from Invasoras. And also this can help other entities to come also to be, get involved in SNIG. So I would like to finalize this presentation just categorizing the, 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 the benefits, the, the, the results in three different uh, groups, the products, the benefits, and the principles which are uh, making our infrastructure evolve and uh, get involved in this uh, linked open data approach. The, these are the people from the project. I would like to mention all the team from the different uh, partners and the entities that support the project and uh, uh, invite you to, to go to the the Facebook and other in the site of the project. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Alessandra. Um, you showed that you basically took the IONET data and then transformed it to Inspire. Is that something that could be adopt, um, adopted by any country? Would that work for any kind of data provider? Uh, f the, to the work that we are doing and the step-by-step -step guidelines for that. Well, uh, at least our GML, <laughs> uh, we validated the GML, and I think that the, the, the approach that is being uh, followed is, uh, is, uh, is useful. It's something that we can uh, think. Uh, we don't have it, I think, uh, in English, but we can uh, uh, try to... To, to disseminate it in, in English. Okay, thanks. Great. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Aetis from National Land Survey of Iceland. Um, first of all, I just want to tell you that it, the, this statement or uh, this, uh, this title, how to implement Inspire with four people, it's not uh, arrogant. It is just to drag more people into the room. Uh, <laughs> seems to have worked. That's fine. Um, first, then, a little bit about Iceland. It is uh, uh, 350,000 people at all in the whole country. It is in the size of 103,000 square kilometers, which is twice the size of Denmark. And, uh, it has municipalities, 72 municipalities. Uh, we are not part of EU, but we are obliged to implement INSPIRE still. And uh, our sport is, as you said, football. And we are quite uh, efficient in the football, and uh, I hope that we will be in this as well. Uh, at the National Land Survey, we are 26. We have the tasks of uh, topographic mapping, we have the geodesy. Our country is moving its direction to centimeters per year. Um, we have the implementation of INSPIRE, the STI. We are in the Arctic STI as well, which is uh, combining Arctic data and uh, making a map of the whole Arctic. That's all the Nordic countries and as well Russia, USA and uh, Canada. Uh, in our team, 
we have one IT specialist, we have one that takes care of the uh, services, one that takes care of the metadata, and then in the, one in the governance. None of them are full-time. And this is implementing Inspire. 3,000 pages of uh, all kinds of technical descriptions, and uh, even though we would all go into it, we would not be able to read it. So, of course, uh, we can say, are there disadvantages, or, uh, uh, and, and uh, so who are the, what are the pros and cons in this? Uh, the pros are, of course, it's easy to call in a meeting, I mean, and there's a quick decision making. It is easy to get uh, an overview, and everybody know each other. It's easy to hand out tasks and not much overlap. And we even know each other and everybody, all the geo people in the other institutes. Then the cons are that there are many tasks on each person. There are not much time to get deep into any things. Uh, we are not really a specialist. Uh, everybody know each other is also a <laughs> con. Um, the um, task is really hanging on one person and all the other institutes have the same situation. So how do we do it? What are we going to do? What, where are we in this implementation? Will we have harmonized the data sets? Uh, we used hail and we used all kinds of sorts of uh, different descriptions. Um, we have uh, one geo portal, that is one geo portal for the whole nation. Every, all the, uh, all the uh, metadata are in one portal. And, uh, what I'm going to tell you now is more just um, a package. You all know this that I'm going to tell you, but I will just put it into a package for you. First of all, I did this myself. <laughs> oh my God. Well, <laughs> yeah. How do I go back? Yes. <laughs> Engineering advice. <laughs> Start again. <laughs> yeah, reput the router. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's let's go there again. Okay. Ah. <laughs> again. Oh, keep it simple. <laughs> we have uh, talked about this as well, and in the workshop that I joined this morning, there were a lot about this. Ah, oh, keep it simple, and and don't uh, do everything at the same time. And some of the things that I'm going to say here might be useful for even someone that is not uh, just with a team of four. Select your words. Explain to people so that they understand. Access to, ac access, uh, give me an access to your existing data. Say that instead of, well, it's a part of the Inspire initiative. Say, uh, provide your data somehow Instead of saying, well, you have to use the WMS, WFS services, well, where we're wrong. Give access to data as is. Say that instead of, well, you have to harmonize your data and, and things like that. Say, make access to some data. Because some data is better than no data. Say that instead of, well, all data that falls under the Inspire initiatives have to, have to be there. Say, Inspire is about access to data. And don't say that it's an initiative that demands you to, to harmonize data and services. <laughs> then, of course, explain a little bit why this is important. Well, in 2016, it was more machines that uh, were searching the internet than humans. That means that all data needs to be accessible for those machines to be uh, able to read them. And if we look at these technical um, um, ten, what is it, ten, 10 technologies which could change our lives, these are reports from 15 and 17 from EU. We can see, again, we can see that, uh, let me go back. <laughs> Very good in this. We can see that there are some clusters in there that are depending on spatial data. And we have to explain this for those that hold the data. That it's important that they are part of what is happening in the world. Then, pick the low-hanging fruits. Work with the people that are willing to listen. 
and also work with the people, people that might understand, that's important as well, work with the people that have access to data and only work with a few at a time. If you have a team of a few people, you can't do everything at the same time. And then, of course, you grow on. Get an overview as well. That we have done that last year. We have uh, made a query and we have sent out a query for getting an overview of uh, all the data sets that are out there. And from there, we can start demanding on the services and on the metadata. Well, get an overview without putting pressure on the data provider yet. It will come. Detect the use cases. There are use cases out there. It's just a question of seeing them and use them as a use cases. I had a use case where we were uh, asked to uh, support a, a um, committee that was going to make a huge uh, national park in Iceland. Uh, they just wanted uh, us to make a map for them, and we provided them with a, a map viewer. We had to find the data, find the right data. We had to simplify data, make the appearance of them. We had to write the metadata for them, and we had to provide it for the committee. We used, in that case, the Oscari tool from Finland, an open source software that is, as well, our geo portal. And there, this committee could play around with the data. We also had the opportunity to talk to the government to the highest level of explaining that we didn't have the access to data and got them to help us into there. We also could show them that the data that was spread in a different map viewers and, and of course were out there, were not the same as when we put it all together and they, to, they themselves could see how the data could be used and the situation in the area. Help out as much as you can. Um, what we do is there are governments uh, that have data that, that are not able to, to do these things. I mean, it's the same as with probably in your countries. So what we did in this is we host the data for others temporarily and run them on our self server. So we get the data, we put them up, we do it for them. Like you see there, there is a data, a lot of data, the, the yellow marked one, that is not from us. The good thing, though, is since I made these slides, this uh, company over there, or this institute over there, has now moved all their data to their own server. So it, it's growing and it's there, but we need to go in, we need to communicate with them, we need to help them out, and we need to take the steps if they are not possible to do it themselves. Then get assistance. Of course you cannot implement Inspire with four people. I mean, that's, that's obvious. But uh, we are four in our institutes, but uh, our colleagues in the Nordic uh, countries, we all together about maybe 20 to 13 people. The Nordic cooperation is crucial for us. It means that we get assistance from them with everything we need to get assistance with. And I think this is very, very important. I mean, instead of everybody trying to figure out what this and that is, we can learn very much from each other with communicating, with talking to each other, with uh, sharing information. Only with the help of the other uh, specialists, we ca one can implement Inspire. That's uh, my statement in here. Finally, keep calm. Okay, what the is the new thematic viewer? And uh, then, then my, my case is like, don't lose your temper when EU changes something. Uh, of course, it is demanding and on all of us when something like that happens. And I, I really, really think that the EU could do better in explaining a little bit for us before they put the demands on us. Uh, at least in our case, uh, we have learned just to keep calm, <laughs> breathe, and it will all solve out. 
And, and the thing is that we are going in the same direction. We might be doing things differently, but we are moving in the same direction, really. And the thing is, as well, and we have learned that, that uh, you might never know what results come out of your actions, but if you do nothing, there will be no results. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know you are really efficient. I knew before because you're more successful than Germany right now in football. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> are there any questions? Well, I have a question. Oh. <laughs> do you have uh, companies involved as well or do you do that as well? Um, we, yeah, well, we have uh, one company that is a private company that is working with us and uh, is also setting up the whole uh, scene of the open source and, uh, and assisting these smaller institutes. So they're doing a geo server stored in the Google Cloud and everything that, that can help out so, so that the, uh, they can be um, sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Danilo Furtado, and I'm from. I'm a member of the SNIG Inspire uh, team from the Portuguese National Mapping Agency, and I'm going to present the recent developments in the Portuguese National Special Data Infrastructure and what we did during the last year in Inspire implementation. Um, as, as Alexandra already said, DGT is the Portuguese National Mapping Agency and is also the national focal point for Inspire implementation and the coordinator of the Portuguese National SDI. Uh, SNIG is available on the internet since uh, 1995. And despite some updates, the job portal has some issues that we are trying to, to solve. So in... Um, 2015, we have made a diagnosis and produced a vision to sneak in 2020 and also an action plan. The main pillars are uh, migration, renewal, and modernization of the sneak platform into an open source solution, a SDI based on open data policy, invested in interoperable data, simplified its discover way of data, empowerment of the geographic information community in terms of awareness and uh, training, create open tools to enhance geographic information interoperability and exploitation, invest in uh, articulation with e-government, and it's also important to guarantee the articulation with uh, local, regional, uh, international, and uh, thematic SDI. Based on the, this vision, we started to working on the geo portal. What are the changes? Migration to a system based on uh, open source uh, technology, development uh, new, new functionalities and improve the existing ones, renewing the design of the geo portal to become it more uh, dynamic and more user friendly, uh, be able for monitoring uh, Inspire services, uh, provide user statistics. Uh, SNIG will have uh, access point for public and for metadata registers. Um, they will be created uh, virtual catalogs to improve metadata search. The map viewer will support multiple reference system and all of this uh, code will be available in GitHub for future use and uh, improvements. Uh, this is the SNIG job portal architecture. Job portal is the main gate to SNIG and uh, promotes access to the remaining components of the system. It's being implemented in uh, Drupal. The geo catalog is the central element of the system and supports the metadata repository. It's being implemented through Gen Network and uh, various changes will be introduced to address uh, specific uh, SNIG needs. Uh, mainly language translation, main page and search uh, adapted to the Portuguese reality, adaption to the uh, Portuguese metadata profile, uh, PostgreSQL 
uh, will be the database used for the metadata catalog and for the geoportal. The map viewer will be implemented uh, in open layers and React uh, JS and will have the typical features of the map viewer. The monitoring model is a back office model. We'll implement a series of monitoring uh, routines that are planned at Inspire level regarding uh, metadata and service uh, performance. Uh, these are the tools that I have uh, already mentioned. All the components uh, will be in open source, including the, including the operating system. Um, now I will show some images of the job portal. This is a prototype. We are still working on it. These are the improvements uh, related to the old job portal. Um, a multi-language portal in Portuguese, English, Spanish, and French. Uh, a tool to search for uh, any keyword and or by location without complete and uh, or by category. Uh, we have an uh, option to advance the search, and we can refine our search to in the left side uh, panel uh, by some attributes that are in the metadata file, like uh, type of resource, inspired team, keywords, providers, etc. There is a relationship between a special data set and special data service. It's possible to have uh, direct access to view and download service link. Uh, in the dashboard viewer. Uh, if the data set has a service, it's possible to visualize the data in the map viewer. These map viewers allow access to the geographic data service, visualization and download, and also to the shapefile, GML, or uh, KML files. The exploration of the geographic data in MapViewer can occur through an integrated mode uh, with the SNIG metadata catalog or through an independent mode because the metadata catalog is integrated in the MapViewer. Okay. We are adapting the GeoNetwork metadata editor to the Portuguese uh, metadata profile. Uh, and in regarding to the Inspire implementation, as you know, European Commission created the uh, GeoPort Automatic Viewer for simplifying the use of the Inspire GeoPortal. After the creation of this uh, beta version, GeoPortal last year, and following the voluntary efforts uh, asked by the, Euro the European Commission, it was necessary to tag the metadata records considering the priority data set keywords. Portugal, Portugal did and continues uh, making an effort and investment a considerable amount of work to provide as many uh, priority data set available uh, for download to the Inspire, uh, through the Inspire Geo Portal. But uh, it's not an easy task. Portugal has um, have many uh, data set with uh, download services, but with uh, interoperability problems. Um, the GeoPortal uh, help desk is an important tool uh, to give uh, support and help us uh, to solve many of these problems. Uh, despite this, it's very hard to, 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 to solve the interoperability problems, but we will continue these, uh, these tasks. So the, the help desk is an important tool. Okay. And I'm finished my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Ulla, National Contact Point of Denmark. Uh, could you tell a little bit more about your help desk? Is that actually a support where you can write in as a user and then get an answer? Or, or how do you, how is that help desk uh, functioning? Yes, we put uh, an answer in the platform and uh, the help desk uh, answer the, the, the question that we, we have. And uh, for us, uh, uh, Angelo works very well and will be very patient to, to answer an, uh, our questions. Uh, how long it took to, to reorganize your, your, your SDI? Uh, the, the job portal? The job portal or maybe yeah. outside as well? 
Yeah, we started uh, in the beginning of this uh, this year in March, and we int we have intention to finish uh, in the beginning of the next year, uh, January February. Um, welcome and thank you for the invitation. I'm technically coordinating the INSPIRE implementation in the NMCA in Austria, and I'm here on behalf of the Austrian Coordination Committee for INSPIRE. Um, we have had the idea to just present ourselves and the coordination body, and it's maybe not that INSPIRE bound, but it's very practical, and my thanks to Iceland, this is exactly the approach that we need. Very pragmatic and um, aiming at the most important things. Um, so let me get you on, on the track of my thinking in here, or of our thinking. In the end, we are doing reports and maps. And these are examples of ESTAT, of the World Bank, of any printing house. And when you do those maps, in these times, you're burning your head, because you are dealing with a lot of sources, of course. Yes, INSPA is harmonizing, but just try to do a map like ESTAT does. It's not that easy in those jungle of uh, data sources. So what you're dealing with are different content, quality, lineage, license models, and delivery requirements. Because as authority, we are building a map not only once, but we do it for a long term. So we have supply chain methodologies involved as well. So this is the setting of modern map production, I have to say, and this is the background of all our things. Well, in the early INSPIRE conferences, we have put this slide up a lot, and I think we have forgotten some of these issues and principles for a long time. But this is what drives us in Austria, in fact, that we put or take data, geospatial data, only at the most effective and responsible body, and we share each other. And we have some collaboration on the organization and legal side. Of course, um, access and use is a topic, metadata is a topic, and in the end, the technical solution is a service-oriented architecture. Because I cannot imagine how I can download the cadastral parcels of Austria within one day because they're renewed every day. So we need the service-oriented approach in here. The collaboration or custodianship here in Austria um, is on different levels. It is the creation of data on one hand, it's on the processing of data and on the dissemination of data. So I will come up with three examples. The auto-imagery creation in Austria, the base map AT, which is a federal map um, in Austria, and addresses, which is also a core data set that is heavily used in different registers. In the past, auto-imagery were produced every seven years in Austria, which is quite old. So we were self-flying as NMCA, we had two planes, and the fact was we were selling those data rarely. The nine provinces commissioned on purpose to fly for their areas. So we had the double financial effort to take as whole country. And in addition, the Ministry of Environment also flew on their purposes with a maximum of five years for agricultural funding. So we had at least three times financial efforts to take. What we do nowadays is we are commissioned this flying every three years. Three years is really hard at the border because we are in the Alpine region. 62% um, are mountains and cloud-free quality can hardly be achieved in this time. Those partners are the federal states, uh, the provinces, the Ministry of Sustainability, NMCA. The NMCA is um, controlling, so coordinating and quality controlling. And in the end, the product is just given to the partners. That's it. If the NMCA would like to sell this product with our own license, we're allowed to do so. There are open data partners in this consortium. They can just spend the data as is, if they like. So there's no license um, um, to each partner, and so we don't interfere within these partners. 
And this is really successful in here, so the perspective is that we do the same thing for airborne laser scanning. The main discussion now is on the quality definition, because quality will drive the price up. The period we can take here, who is doing the coordination at least? This is really hard work, uh, the commissioning and the coordination. And of course, how we will deal with the financing. Is it done on the federal level or the province level? So I think this first partnership on the creation of data set is quite successful and we are working this direction. Let's come up with the processing of data, the base map IT. Nine provinces of Austria um, are partners. They are in a consortium, the Geoland AT, and they provide a governmental base map with an update frequency of two months. This is the example you see here. It's freely available on the web as WMTS, and you can also download those um, tiles. Well, NMCA is not involved. I have to say, we refused in the beginning to be involved in here, which was a strategic um, issue, of course. But in the end, they are doing a great job in here. And in the end, since last year, we are also partner in here. Um, it's a decentral production. And you, in here you see these nine provinces. And it's on the basis of a multimodal transport network graph, um, which is also used for other purposes. It's a comprehensive transport network. Um, we have had in here a lapse of time. It's really clearly defined. And a central distribution. Although it's a decentral production, we have a central uh, distribution. So for all those nine provinces, they have their own databases for the preparation of these data sets. And they have a synchronization deadline, which then delivers to the central data store at GIP-AT. And in there, we provide or prepare the data um, to export for the dissemination channels, which is um, open government data, Inspire, Basemap IT, and others. The deadlines are really strict. So what does this mean? You can see the timelines in here. Between those two red crosses, there are a lot of things to do. And quality checking, renewing, re-uploading, whatever. If your data set is not clarified within this time and not uploaded, it will be not in this time slot. And this works quite fine. So at least it could be that not all the data are updated every two months, but then every four months. So it's just missing one deadline. And this has to be done so strict because of the supply chain, the processing at the central endpoint then. The base data set is a multimodal transport network graph, and in a fully automated derivation, we come up with a base map at different levels. So of course, as cartographer, there is some improvement that has to be done in here, but more improvement has to be done on the dissemination side. We are having about, in the peak times, 50 million requests a day, and this brings up to the border, capacity border of the band white. So we are thinking of putting this data into vector tiles, and we are researching on this at the moment. So the end result is, um, I think, really use, useful. People like it, especially because it's usable and available here in a very high availability. But of course, this is just one dissemination channel. It's also on the new Geo portal, and the GIP-AT can be found in here. So if you're looking for the road transport network in Austria, it's fully delivered here, also the air, air network and so on. So let's come up with a third um, example, which is the central address register in Austria, a complete different setting, complete different partners. And what we're doing here is working together with 2,500 municipalities. You can see upside. And you can imagine that those employees, those, those people, have a different interpretation of the point of the geo-reference point of the address. So in the end, you have to be very clear in the specification how to set the address point in the parcel and the building and so on. Those data are geo-referenced at the NMCA. There's the address register. It's centrally stored. And it's used in the buildings and housing register. It's used in the population register. So it's really disseminated in different uh, national registers. 
The NMCA maintains those addresses uh, of the parcels within the list of properties. Um, we provide disseminate those addresses centrally as services and, of course, for the e-government. The municipalities, on their own, assign those addresses, manage the addresses, and geocode new addresses. So a lot of things to do for the municipalities. And it's really a hard job if you have changes, quality changes. The amount maybe is not that big. It's two and a half million points uh, per level. So we have a level for the addresses, for the buildings, um, and um, those for the parcels. Of course, we have had a lot of quality issues in here. So it were up to 1% that was not correct. It was not lying on the parcel, it was not on the street, and so on. <coughs> and then we thought about a new custodianship in combining the transport network and the addresses, putting it together. Because the transport network had the issue that the emergency units could not find the address, especially in the Alpine regions. Or on the other hand, the address register said, no, the quality is not at the entrance. The point is not at the entrance. We have to change this. So we combined the street graph and addresses with a win-to-win -win situation. On one hand, the street graph, the blue one, gets the address point just directly on the graph and we move the parcel address point near the entrance. So it's a win-to-win -win situation for both data sets. And um, we are now adopting this um, procedure also for the buildings, which is more critical because statistical the statistical unit is using the building's points for the regional statistical rasters. Um, in the end, we were removing those inherent errors a lot, and we are down to the sub-promil um, error rate for this data set. Again, this is publicly available as a um, portal, and it's also embedded in the base map, and um, it's used by the people. Are there any drawbacks if we are working together, if we are open as SDI? Yes, there are. The things that you have to deal with is the quality aspect, the temporal coherence, redissemination, implementation speed if you have new requirements, so change requirements, and the harmonization work per occurrence. So there are some recommendations maybe to overcome this, or how we did overcome this, or how, what we do. We specify those scales that are needed in the base map, of course. They have to be specified. Um, the temporal coherence, you have seen that we are going for the reference points. So we have two month slots, and there's a very clear reference point for the data set. Um, this is needed in order to um, remove the time coherence. Well, I have told you how we do for the auto imagery and the common um, common creations. We have a CC BY AT license in Austria. So I imagine that the CC BY AT is not valid for Europe. Um, we have to rethink those open licenses. Open license does not mean that we are, can work together. And maybe we have to be very strict for European license in order to be free for us as member states. Um, new requirements occur in this technical scenery that we are working in, and what we really need is a continuous change program. This is what we are doing in the MIC for Inspire. It's also needed at the member state level. And then, of course, um, data harmonization does not prevent from data wrangling. Whenever you do a map, first picture you've seen, you will have to deal with data wrangling. You will have to prepare your data, even if they're harmonized. If they're harmonized, you can automate a lot of parts, but data wrangling is a consistent task that is in there. It is needed. So I could only tell you so whenever possible because it um, creates technological freedom because of using the standardized interfaces. It establishes a mutual dependency, not a one-side one. Um, it forces permanent changes and it creates this extensible stakeholder network. So what is needed is organizational, collective, process flow, involvement, and license commitment. So thank you for attendance. Um, if you have any questions for Austria, just give us an email. 
If you're interested in the actual scenery of the GSC has participated, the service-oriented mapping book at Springer is out now. Um, it's the state of the art how we do service-oriented mapping today. Thank you. Take you one minute. A congratulation, Marcus, you have demonstrated to me what Inspire is all about. The example you gave there with the emergency service that now functions better because you have combined these data sets, it's a great example. What I'm intrigued about is that uh, you had the nine lenders working independently, but still the product, the base map, is a homogeneous product for the user community. So you have agreed on portrayal and etc. Are you also doing the same thing within river basins, for example, with Germany? And when you talked about the lighted data and the different charging or e-commerce that possibly could apply, when now a German authority would ask for using the lighter data to do something on flood risks within a river basin you share, how would you deal with that? I'm sorry, a short answer. <laughs> Well, um, this principle is also adopted to other topics in Austria. Let's stay at the Austrian level. Of course, for the base map, um, the exchange with neighboring countries is no problem. So we are in a consortium with um, Germany, Swiss, and Austria at the Lake Constance, for example. And we try to um, identify requirements in this area. And of course, um, if we speak of exchanging or opening these licenses, um, then this means the financial issue are solved. So there's nothing against sharing it in the end. Yeah. Okay, I want to close this session. We got more or less half past. Uh, I notice uh, that there are still a lot of people in this room and this is a big compliment, I think, to the presenters. And that's why I ask for a final applause.